thanks for having me. And uh, we're good to go on this lap mic. And uh, I'm going to take a similar kind of a structure to my talk. Um, and I think as different as part of this may seem, I think it actually shares some of the very, very fundamental values that we just heard. And so I'm very honored to, to be presenting this in the context of what we just heard. So that is me in my office at Stanford. And, uh, and this is you know, what I do is I'm a computer music researcher. I'm also a designer. I work with code. I write a lot of it. Um, and I build things uh, like instruments, toys, apps, games, social experiences, uh, and programming languages, which I will demo in just a moment. Uh, I like turning code, a lot of it, into sound. I like to generate sound from writing code. I work with the Laptop Orchestra. This is SLORT, the Stanford Laptop Orchestra. And we are a group of humans and computers and special hemispherical speakers and uh, making music together. And uh, we have concerts coming up in May and June. So check us out at slork.stanford.edu. Also, I make apps like Ocarina. But I'm going to actually go far, farther back in time and rewind and uh, to kind of to get a bit of my, uh, my own, how did I come to be, I guess, like whatever it is that I am today. Uh, I was born in Beijing, and I grew up on the seventh floor of this building. <laughs> and I uh, grew up with my grandparents. That's me at age four. And uh, my parents were working in other parts of the country. Now, this is right after the Cultural Revolution. It was a kind of an interesting time for China, and it continues to be. And since my childhood, Beijing has gone, gone more congested and polluted. But I feel like my hometown still has its moments. Um, as a designer, I think the first thing I remember designing very intentionally is, are these bricks made out of mud I found downstairs in our building, which I carefully wrapped in newspaper and put under the bed to fashion into what I thought was going to be gold. <laughs> I kid you not. I think the form of the gold brick somehow pleased me. And I wanted to, in some kind of blunt, alchemistic effort, like literally try to make money, uh, which I tried to pawn off on my friends. Uh, which did not work. I tried to, <laughs> but you know, I think I was a weird kid. But I think, as we just heard, I, I think that the point actually is, I, I think all kids are weird, right? Kids do things that make no sense to their adult selves, and I think that's what makes childhood so wonderful and uninhibited. You know, kids are beholden to nobody. And that's why kids are so free to be themselves. And I think as we grow up, yeah, we. We work, we grapple, try so hard to hold on to that playful part of ourselves. It, it is so hard. And, but as a child, play, I did, and I did a lot. I read comic books. I played with toys. I, I didn't play a lot of video games until I got here because I didn't have a lot of money. I would just go to the arcades, and I'd watch people play video games for hours, and I was fascinated. Something about the bright pixel on the screen moving just had an endless fascination to, to me to this day. And I still play video games, like StarCraft. I was playing StarCraft last night. Like These things, really, I think it is quite true that we are very much fashioned by the things we love and the things we do. And I guess this is part of who I am. Um, I came to the US at the age of nine. These are my parents uh, who got me electric gu uh, a guitar at the age of 13, which completely changed my life, because then it wasn't just you know, about loving music, but loving the making of it, the active, proactive act of actually rendering music from learning an instrument. And also, uh, high school also was actually really nice back then. I feel like life in high school has gotten a lot more difficult nowadays compared to, say, 20 years ago. I went to college and studied computer science before it was like a thing. I studied computer science because it was fun, because I like building things. It's like mud bricks, but now I get to do write code and kind of take what's in here and, and realize it, put it out into the world. And I had great friends, two of whom are actually sitting in the audience here tonight. Um, and I was learning computer science, but I also realized I was learning something about life. You know, this is my professor, Owen Astrakhan. He said, there are two good answers to any question. I don't know, and it depends. <laughs> this, any software engineer will tell you that these actually are pretty good answers to almost any question. <laughs> Right, But it's like that in life, too. So I think computer science for me was this thing that kind of also helped me to really appreciate things, actually including computer science. The day I learned that computers have their fundamental limits was a beautiful philosophical and aesthetic moment for me, to know a thing is to know its limits. 
And on that last day of the first semester at Duke, when Owen Astrakhan was like, hey, here's some things computers cannot do. I was like, oh, that's, that's beautiful. It, help, it makes you understand computers a little bit more. Uh, I went to grad school also in computer science. I studied with Perry Cook on the bottom right here, who taught me pretty much everything I know about computer music. Um, and, uh, and for my thesis at, at Princeton, I, I worked on a programming language for music. And I'm going to give you a quick demo of it now. Let me make sure oh, there's a sound. So I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that so we can kind of see it from scratch. Here's a sign ask. I'm going to call it foo. I'm going to use this operator to chuck it to the DAC. Now that's the output of the sound. I'm going to set foo's frequency to 440 hertz. And I'm going to say advance time by two seconds by chucking two seconds to now. Now chuck in the language, the name comes from the act to throw. So here we're going to throw two seconds to the present. And when we do this, we hear what we just heard, which is a sine wave of 440 hertz for two seconds. Now I'm going to just take this and uh, copy and paste this three times. Uh, and I'm going to have the frequency and double it here. What do you think that's going to do to the pitch? Well, it's going to go down an octave and then go up here. So we hear successive octaves. Now. Let's put this into an infinite loop, because why not? <laughs> and you don't need to indent, but you know, it just looks better when you do. <laughs> this is going to go on for a long time, unless we stop that. And now let's take just one of these lines, and let's generate a random number between, say, 30 and 1,000, and set that as foo's frequency every second. This Every half a second. Every 200 milliseconds. Every 100 milliseconds. We should pause here to reflect that we have just achieved computer music. Right? This is, this is the music, the sound that, yo, wow, you guys are really easy, thanks. Uh, this is the sound that like, you know, mainframe computers, like, like an old sci-fi movies, this is the sound they're making when they're thinking really hard. Um, you can keep going, 10 milliseconds. One millisecond. This is still one single sine wave, and we're just changing its frequency 1,000 times per second. Now, we, I should point out here, we crossed an interesting perceptual threshold in which we stop perceiving individual bleeps and bloops, kind of these events, but we perceive this continuous carpet of sound, really. And it happened right around 20 to 30 hertz. It's one of the few places where our auditory system and our visual systems kind of line up perceptually. It's, you know, it's right around there that we stop per perceiving individual frames and start perceiving continuum. That was interesting. I didn't make, I didn't make that sound. That's like a sign sweep. Uh, you can keep going up. You can say one millisecond, one second. You can do a minute, hour, day, week. This is a very slow evolving thing. You can just say 52 weeks is my notion of a year. In every 1,000 years, there will be a new random frequency. So that's Chuck, kind of in a nutshell. Um, and uh, it's open source. It's freely available. You can get it at chuck.stanford.edu. I like to say it crashes equally well in all commodity operating systems. So if things start behaving weirdly, it's probably Chuck's fault. And that kind of brings us more or less to the present moment. Um, and I started at Stanford in 2007, 2008. I co-founded Smule. And uh, I kind of tripped and fell into that because I d definitely did not come to Stanford planning to start a company. But sometimes when you're not looking to start a company, it's probably when you're most likely to probably start a company. So there you go. And for the last three years, I've been writing this book, Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime. I thought it was going to take me like one year, but it took me three. It's just like writing code. You know that law that says, you know, any software system is going to take three times as long as you honestly estimate, even when you take this rule into account. <laughs> book, writing a book is kind of like that. And I started writing about computer music design, but then I realized, you know, this is just about design in general. It's not just specific computer music. So it became meditation on design 
as a humanistic, artistic, and social act of engineering. Drawing from my engineering background, but really maybe marrying that with my interest in thinking about you know, how do we build things that actually speak to who we are as human beings? And there, you have to really engage the humanistic, the artistic, and really the social. And I did it in a format which I felt like, well, first I was gonna write a more conventional book, but then I was like, hey, I have a lot of photos. I was talking a lot of figures. So I was like, wait, I grew up on comic books. Maybe I can have comic book passages in which the things I talk about could talk back at me, like you know, a phone could actually have a conversation with me. So then I was like, hey, I can just make half of this a comic book, but then I'm like, hey, the medium after all maybe could be the message. What if the entire book was a comic book? So that's how you end up with a 488 page photo comic uh, <laughs> about design. And really I think it gets at these three fundamental questions. What is the nature of design? Two, what does it mean to design well? I think this is a question we are not asking enough. We're asking how do we design something? But less often do we ask, how do we design it well? And what does it mean to design something well? And also related, what does it mean to design ethically? Right? What, is, what do these questions actually mean? So I'll try to deep dive a little bit on each of these. First, design is something I note, is something we all do. Right? Artful design would say design is nothing more than this act of alignment. We design to bring the world into pragmatic alignment what we, with what we consider to be useful and into aesthetic alignment with our notion of what's good and beautiful or the way things ought to be. Within this creative endeavor are real, rich, expressive opportunities to speak to our human dimension. That is part of the manifesto of artful design. Right? Design is nothing more than this. And all of us, by this definition, design many, many, many times a day. But there is a difference to doing it intentionally versus doing it less intentionally. Here's another example of design. Now this is something I designed 10 years ago with Smule, and this is Ocarina. Now this is a kind of an instrument for your phone. You play by blowing into it. Multi-touch controls pitch. Um, vibrato is controlled by accelerometer. I'm blowing into the microphone. There's a Chuck script running in here that's actually tracking the strength in which, with which I'm blowing into the phone. And uh, you can play little ditties with this. And so on. So this is a, it's a toy. It's kind of an instrument. And uh, this is Ocarina in gameplay mode. You can see the design is quite minimal. It's just the functional parts of an ocarina. And the idea here is, I don't want you to feel like you're playing in an app that's a facsimile of an ocarina. I want you to feel like your phone is the ocarina, right? This is an aesthetic statement that's being made. And these four quadruplet of circles in here are actually uh, telling you what note to play next, right? I've given this talk, I don't know how many times, but this is the only time in which Trisha, the graphic designer, who worked together with me on this app is actually in the audience. So thanks, Trisha. Um, and yeah, let's hear for Trisha. She's somewhere out there. But there's another dimension to Ocarina, and it's a social one. In Ocarina, you can listen to other people around the world blow into their phones. Here's Anonymous playing O Shenandoah from the East Coast. Who are these people? I don't know. This app is not designed to tell you that. But this app is designed to maybe get you to ask that question. Right? This is what I think of when I think of this. This is an attempt at artful design. Here's Legend of Zelda coming from Indonesia, right? This is kind of an, an, an anonymous social network. Identity does not matter here. But it's here to make you feel that small sense of connection with someone somewhere out there doing this physical activity. Susanna, and people have listened to each other like 40 million times on this globe. And this is an example of design as a social experience, right? Uh, the philosopher John Stuart Mill once said, eloquence is heard, but poetry is overheard, right? It's like beauty isn't about like putting something out there and going back to check how many people liked it. it beauty is making something that you feel good about, that, that's you. And you put it out there because it's an end in itself. 
and, and hopefully someone else will find it, and maybe they'll find some connection with that. And you may never know that. And in fact, if you try to know that, sometimes you break the kind of the beauty of the thing. So in some ways, design is about as much about what you don't do as what you actually do. Um, this is a, from an Ocarina user in 2009 uh, who left this review in iTunes. This is my peace on Earth. I'm currently deployed in Iraq. And hell on Earth is an everyday occurrence. The few nights I may have off, I'm deeply engaged in this app. The globe feature that lets you hear everybody else in the world playing is the most calming art I've ever been introduced to. It brings the entire world together without politics or war. It is the exact opposite of my life. Now, as a designer, you know how good it feels when someone actually uses your product. But this is like kind of another level for us, because this is humbling. You know, something we built actually brought apparently like a, a moment of peace, you know, to, to another person. And, 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 and there's something in that. Um, I'll give you another example of design. You know, this is a f this is what I call the world's most depressing photo album software. And it is really, it's, it's created by my grad student, June Oh, and myself back in 2011. And it's really this problem, you know, we take a lot of photos with our phones. And I would say we take a lot more photos than we go back to look at, than we go back to look at. It's more of like a take-only process. There's, it's like write-only. We don't really read as much. Uh, so what we did was actually to correct, collect photos from strangers and put them into this one space. Right? This is kind of the metaphor for kind of a collective memory of mundane moments. Uh, but you can blow this up. And this, is, this becomes a metaphor for memory. Right? These fragments are really just fragments of our memory. And what we can do is to call them back. Oh, here's me typing. I'm going to have much shorter hair. Let's try another one. This is daily cleansing. I don't know who took these. But look at the time. This is eight years, 11 months, 12, 22 days, nine hours, two minutes, one, two, three seconds, four seconds ago. Right? This is, doesn't, it doesn't tell you the day. This, this counts backwards from the present moment. And this is to make you realize, well, this may be a really mundane moment that all of us can relate to, but you will never be as close to this moment as you are now. In fact, this very mundane moment is forever receding away from us. And in that, maybe, these mundane moments, moments aren't so mundane after all. Um, and you can, you can actually bring back kind of just all these images in the database if you want. Look through these. Night can turn into day. And let's go ahead and make it snow a bit. But then if you zoom out far enough, there's actually a little physics engine on here. It obeys Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Things towards the middle fortunately rotate more quickly. So you get a natural galactic arm if you just rotate out. And these are still just fragments from our, our memories, right? And at some point, this can converge into a point. It can blow up. It can reform into its constituent photos. And when we did this as a piece in the laptop orchestra, the way it ended was that we blew it up, and then this converged into this, bl this blob, which receded like away from us. Where it goes, we do not know. So yes, the world's uh, possibly most depressing photo album software. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really kind of an homage to the, the mundane moments. Now, all of this is to say I think good design enables us. We, well, we all know this intuitively. But I want to say great design understand something about us, much in the same way that art, great art does. What is great art? Well, I can't tell you a definition for great art. But maybe all I can tell you is that great art isn't when you understood how great the art is. It's when you feel like the art has understood something about you. Think about a favorite song, a painting, a movie that really speaks to you. Think about why that is. I might offer that maybe it's because you feel like it understood some part of you or some a person you are, a person you were or your relationship to another person. It gets you so completely that you feel like you could have created that piece of art yourself. That's how completely it does. So this brings me really to this third point, is that if design can have this impact on the way we think, feel, and maybe act, then we need to ask this third question. But what does it mean to design ethically? Certainly, we, you know, the world today thinks of ethics and technology in this Frankensteinian term. 
which is like, how do we not do evil? How do we do no harm? Right? I will offer that this is not an easy thing to achieve. And Google's bygone motto. I will also offer this is a rather low bar. <laughs> right? What happened to do good? These are fundamentally different things, right? And more than that, I think for me, the question of ethics and technology is actually a question. It's how do we want to live with our technologies? Right? That, I think, expands the question of ethics from like a leash on technology to something that's more foundational, something you bake in into the very foundation of the things you build, the things you design, whatever it is that you're designing. First law of Kranzberg's laws of technology. Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Companies don't get to say, we are a technology company. We build platforms. What people do on that platforms is not our responsibility. Right? And so really, the ethical argument for, for design, in artful design, goes something like this. The choices we make in design hold implications for our users and are tantamount to taking action ourselves. Right? This is saying, like, face to face, we hold ourselves to certain moral ethical standards. Like, I, I don't go up to a stranger and punch them in the face for no reason. <laughs> Yet we seem to do things like that with, on the internet and in more metaphorical terms. And as designers, if the things we design do change the way people think, feel, and act, then if we believe this, then shouldn't we hold ourselves to the same moral ethical frameworks? as we already hold ourselves to face to face, right? And what if that is what ethics really mean when it comes to technology? And if there's one rule I would just propose that we can run every, every design decision around and through, it's really the platinum rule. Now, how many people here have heard the golden rule? Right, what's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How many people have heard the platinum rule? Zero, okay. What is the platinum rule? The platinum rule says, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Right? Think about the difference there. Right? And this actually, if we go, if I may be philosophical for just a moment, we can go back to Immanuel Kant, who in the second formulation of his categorical imperative said, act so that you treat humanity, whether in yourself or in another person, never as a means to an end, but always as an end in itself. This is the platinum rule. This means, well, the golden rule is kind of like sympathy. It's like, yeah, whatever works for me, I'm going to hope that works for you too. The platinum rule says, well, I'm going to put myself in your shoes, even though your experience may be so different from mine. But I'm going to do my hardest to figure out what you are about and what you really, really want. And that is how I'm going to proceed with every decision I make in design. This is what it means to treat another person as an end in itself. And if you run every decision through this, you might find that every decision you make might actually apply in some way to this grid work. In this sense, technology is never an end in itself, and people should never be a means to an end. So this is the last design I'll present, and that's the book itself. It's a book, I say, for the engineer with the soul. It starts out in my office, and uh, we look at the designs of buildings, everyday things like pencil bags. Um, to Ocarina, and really kind of the science and the digital signal processing behind that, but also visual design of simple forms to complex visual systems like Converge, which we just saw. Chapter four is all about programmability and sound design. Chapter five about interface design. Interface as the membrane of interaction between humans and technology, where we look at the theremin to Rebecca Fiebring talking about putting humans in the loop in artificial intelligence systems that actually have, are designed to take human curation at every step in there. And isn't that a more inspired way to think about artificial intelligence? To game design is more than entertainment, but something that we can use to express ourselves or to understand our emotions a little bit better than we do now. Chapter seven, social design. Asking what are the values of a social tool and what do we really want from our social tools? And the last chapter really encapsulates this idea of what we make makes us. This is the chapter on ethics, right? Design lives with us, shaping our everyday lives indirectly, our desires, disposition, and character. 
Again, this is the ethical argument for artful design. So the golden, maybe the golden rule of artful design is that we do not only design from needs that are perceived, but from the values that underlie them. Whatever you're designing, yeah, you can say I'm designing this to solve a problem, but behind that problem is actually a deeper human need. And I think design is time for design to transcend just thinking about immediate needs, but also to think about the invisible, need, the invisible needs that underlie them. And so there has to be an artistic leap on the part of the designer that results from seeing and feeling the world at large like an artist. Designers are less problem solvers and more artists, philosophers, engineers of useful things that understand us. Again, it comes back to this idea of understanding. How do we create things that we feel that makes us feel understood? Again, like a favorite song. So tomorrow's engineer, I argue, has to be much more than a specialist, but something of a technological artist, a moral ethical inventor, and a system designer who can contextualize the things we build in the broader context of society, of person-to-person -person relationship, and what it means to actually flourish as human beings and as a society of human beings. In higher ed, we have a T, what we call a T-shaped student. Actually, we have an I-shaped student. That student is like just heads down on one thing. Now, the T-shaped student, you got some depth, you got some breadth. That's better. I'm going to introduce my formulation of the pie-shaped student. <laughs> on one leg is disciplinary expertise, computer science. That was me. The other leg, domain expertise, like public health, or in my case, music. But this horizontal bar, well, that, I say, is the aesthetic lens, the philosophical, artistic, and moral lens that gives broader meaning and context in bridging these two legs. And in a way, this, I think, is why the arts, the humanities, and social sciences matter, matter fundamentally to engineering, and vice versa, is that to be a good engineer, you got to be more than just a good engineer. you got to be a good human being to really engineer things that understand one another. And I'm trying to teach this at Stanford. This is a critical thinking course called Design That Understands Us. You know, we're thinking about what, what does it mean to design well and ethically in, in this age. We look at the nature, the craft, the ethics, the experience, and the future of design. And we read Aristotle, Mary Shelley. Actually, reading Frankenstein as not only the first science fiction story of the modern era, but also really a science fiction story about strong AI, asking what are our moral obligations as designers to the designed, right? Think about that. There's something very, very, very deep, I think, about the questions that I think actually gets posed. Uh, Bruno Minari's design is art, Don Norman's human-centered design and design of everyday things, and artful design as kind of a synthesizer, a lot of these ideas, but also this manifesto about how we need to transcend the way we think about design today. I'll leave you with this final thought. Juliana, who is a, a colleague in philosophy, asked, hey, good, do you think we'll ever have robot musicians? I said, yeah, you mean as, as good as humans? She said, yeah, that's what I mean. I usually, by the way, just say, no, I don't think so. But in this case, I thought about it. And I said, hmm, I think we'll have true robot musicians the day we have true robot philosophers. She said, ha, because that would mean machines will have understood something subtly more human. I said, yeah. I mean, isn't music more than notes on a page or sound waves through the air, more than a product? It is also a process with meaning. And for me, like these questions of where we're going with technology, it's, it's not really the answers we're seeking. It's actually the right questions we're seeking, right? Like the, the quality of any answer really depends on the quality in the terms in which, on which the question is actually asked. And so at this point, this is actually why I'm trying to educate people to think for themselves at Stanford, who many of whom will be engineers, right? Is that I think we actually need to all be some kind of philosophers in our own right, you know, to actually think about kind of, you know, what it means to actually create things that, you know, for human flourishing. And it comes back to this question, how do we want to live with our technologies? So artful.design is the website. You can go there and you can order the book. The book is out and there's a lot more that you can find there. A lot of material as well as the course itself. Uh, one final example that we'll play for you is, uh, is from our app. This was actually called Glee Karaoke back in the day after the show. Now it's called Sing. This is social karaoke. Now in 2000, 
2012, a woman reached out in Japan in the wake of this, the tsunami and earthquake disasters and uh, invited the world to sing with her. Now, in the app, you can listen to other people sing, but you can also add your voice in a plus one kind of a way to, to the chorus. Within weeks, 4,000 people joined in from all over the world, strangers presumably, and uh, in a rendition of Lean On. <laughs> Design can happen without technology, but I think when design really works, hopefully the user never notices the technology. Thank you all very much.